Hello, friends. Um, we are glad that you're taking the time to join us today for this pastoral discussion. Uh, this is now our second discussion, and originally, originally we had intended uh, for these to help us to communicate with our church about uh, things that are happening during the coronavirus. Uh, we know that our church is going through a really hard time with this pandemic, and that many people still can't get out. However, um, the events of this past week have overshadowed the needs of our own church to reopen, and they've really shed a light on a national issue, and it's, it's really a historic issue and a historic moment uh, that we think has more long-term significance to our church than uh, reopening does, as much as that's on the mind of all of us. So as the pastors gathered early this week, it became apparent to us that there's a gospel issue that's buried under the politics and the rhetoric and the noise that you might take in on cable news or on the internet. So uh, if you can, I would ask you to separate uh, out the politics, uh, the left, the right ideology, and just listen to four pastors talking about what's happening in our church from a biblical perspective. Um, and I'm not saying that we have it right, uh, but we want to take this moment to listen and to be willing to engage. And so here with us, we have uh, Dr. Lillian Buckley. She's the pastor at First Baptist Church in Exeter, which is a sister church of ours. And actually, I think... Um, we're a church plant of Exeter. Is that right, Ken? Like <laughs> I've heard that. Heard uh, that. Like 160 years ago, uh, they planted us. So we are. Uh, you are our mother church. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so they've been hosting our association breakfast for the past couple of years, and uh, we've enjoyed uh, the fellowship and getting to know Lillian through those meetings. And so this is really just kind of a continuation of of the fellowship that we enjoy. Uh, during those times. But um, as we uh, get started, just before we uh, hit record, I learned that the George Floyd Memorial is happening right now. And so it's significant that uh, uh, we're doing this at this time. Um, just before we get to the discussion, I just want to let you guys know what we're trying to accomplish through this. Uh, first, we're just simply trying to engage our, con our congregation with a larger discussion of race and oppression that the Bible talks about that uh, is, it, that's going on in our country, and just to address that as, as people of God. Um, secondly, we want to help people who are living in a largely wh white area and attending a largely white church to understand that there is, uh, this isn't something that's far away and in the city. Um, I hope, we hope, that we'll see that this is something that's right here, and that's the gospel part of this, um, of this conversation. And then finally, to give people direction, about something that um, they can do individually and what we can do corporately as a church uh, in a larger body of Christ to speak up for the oppressed. Um, so before we start, Pastor Ken, uh, would you just uh, mind giving a quick prayer um, uh, and start starting us off with a quick word of prayer? Yeah, Lord, we're grateful that you have instilled within each of us the um, soul uh, that is in the image of God. Uh, that we are uh, all sinners and we uh, still have been given this privilege to reflect your glory in all things. We pray for you to give us insight into our own soul, into our own prejudices, um, that you would guard our heart from becoming um, a Cain and Abel story uh, right off the bat, uh, where there is anger and frustration and jealousy. Uh, Lord, would you would you lead us into not only truth from your word about ourselves and you, but also uh, an understanding of each other. Thank you for the gifts of ministry you've given to each of us, for the ministries you've raised each of us for, and for the treasure and jars of clay that we represent as you have given your spirit to each of us. Pray for Lillian, uh, not only as a woman and as a pastor, but as a sister in Christ. And uh, would, you, would you give her um, insight into things that we need to know and hear uh, by the time we're done today? Uh, glorify yourself, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, so, like we said, the, uh, the, this whole thing is, uh, started with the George Floyd 
killing and um, that's the memorial service is happening right now. I'm just uh, curious to throw the, the first question out to anybody. Um, uh, how did you hear about this and what was your reaction? If you remember what you heard. Um, I don't remember exactly when I heard, but I do know when I heard uh, the news also came that the police officers involved had been fired and that was it. They hadn't been charged with a crime. And that devastated me more than even the idea that a man had died because I'm so used to hearing about black people being killed by police officers in this country that I hadn't seen the passing of Mr. Floyd because it was so long, you know, when you see it afterwards, it takes your breath away. But I had learned that someone had died at the hand of an officer and that they had just simply been fired. I felt violated and very disturbingly, I was angry. I was so angry, I, I, cut, I got some scissors and cut my hair. I just wanted to do something to look different than I did the day before. I just, I just was seething with, uh, we're unheard again, and justice is not served again. So that's, that's what happened with me. What about you guys? I was, um, when I heard about it, my first reaction was not again. Uh, not, not again. Um, I, um, it happened actually when I heard it was in Minneapolis. Um, I went to seminary in Minneapolis. And so immediately I localized it and I began to um, try to figure out where it was. And it turns out it was not too far from where I lived. And um, I didn't, I was, I was not expecting the same sort of, uh, I wasn't expecting the reaction that it got. Um, I thought, you know what, this is something and it's going to go away and it's, this will go away in another week or so. And uh, as things went on, although I do know Minneapolis and it's a, a very diverse place. Um, and I, uh, as the protests went on, these guys can tell you, I came in on Saturday for our church recording and uh, I had been up for much, much of the night watching the neighborhood um, that I lived in um, uh, burn. And it was, it was very, dis, very troubling to me because um, I knew many people, I know many people, uh, family and friends who are in those uh, neighborhoods. Um, and um, yeah, so I was a lot, a lot of people, but um, it touches me that you, you said you cut your hair, um, that, that you just didn't want to, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's poignant. I've not cut my hair. <laughs> because of coronavirus. And you should. <laughs> and I should. I need it bad. <laughs> Anyone else? I was like a, a, a typical millennial spending too much time on my phone, uh, either late last week, it must have been late last week, scrolling Twitter, just like I do in some downtime. And all of a sudden, uh, the picture shows up on my Twitter feed of uh, the police officer on top of Mr. Floyd. And I was so consumed with the coronavirus and social distancing at the time that I thought it was gonna be a meme for uh, people breaking social distancing rules, frankly. That, I was just was so consumed in the pandemic that it didn't even, my first glance was not even um, something that was much more, but it was, I, th I thought it was something pandemic related. And uh, didn't take long to realize that was not it. Uh, and then I went from, uh, self selfishly thinking about how this was going to be construed by media for social distancing or, or rebelling against authority to a whole different kind of rebelling against authority and law breaking. Uh, and my, my mind and heart went to horror right away while looking at the same post uh, after reading more and understanding that this was, uh, like Lillian said, not again, not again. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I need to expose my upbringing, which is uh, white and surrounded by white people and uh, grew up with Martin Luther King being shot. And I saw that as a tragedy because it was a shooting of another human. I, I just, I'm just haven't been exposed to uh, racism. 
Um, in fact, I, I read this book uh, a couple of months ago, Between the World and Me. It's written by a black man. And he writes about um, the struggles of being uh, a, a black man we, living in a white society. And I, I just, I just find, I, I need to learn about this. I need to hear the story. And if he tell the, tells the story after story, it was, um, um, how, how do we, how do we, how do we get out of this? So when I uh, heard about the shooting, I was actually angry at the police officer because he had just murdered another human being. It wasn't so much as a black man, it was a human being. Um, and, and, and the exposure that uh, it has gotten has again driven me to the realization that I, I just, don't, I don't understand. I don't understand the perspective. I don't understand the, the anger and the frustration. Uh, and um, so, so I, I, that's why I'm here. I, I, I wanna learn. I want to know. Amen. And that's really why we're all here is uh, um, to listen, uh, to listen and to learn and to consider. And I think there's a gospel uh, that that's what the gospel tells us. Um, the Bible t uh, tells us that. So I want to um, thank you yeah, go ahead. for doing this. Though. I want to thank you because you don't, you didn't have to care about this. And as I've gotten to know you, I've grown to love each of you and respect you. And I think, that's important for me to say. Uh, I really have a, uh, a there's a kindred spirit between us. And in spite of you living in, the, in a lily white world, um, for some reason, this is important to you right now. And I, I just have to say thank you for including me today. Yeah. Amen. Well, we love you and we respect you and we wouldn't have you here if we didn't respect you. So. We're, we're eager to hear what you uh, have to uh, your perspective. Um, Stephen, can you talk a little bit about, bit about yesterday, we, or actually uh, two days ago, we posted a bl uh, black square on the church's social media uh, websites or platforms. Um, can you just explain a little bit about what that means and what went into the decision to, uh, to post that? Um, there has been you know, some, some maybe misunderstandings that we would like to explain and, and uh, clarify what, what that means. And what we mean by that. And before you answer that, it, it ought to be clear that Stephen and Grant and I all decided to post this. So Stephen's not hanging out here by himself. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll give just a brief background as to the progression of the weekend. So it started with me. I was reading Twitter. And then things progress as the weekend goes on. Um, Monday was my wedding anniversary. And so my wife and I are, are, we're out just enjoying, you know, we have a babysitter. We're out just enjoying a beautiful day. Monday, um, and Monday is usually a day where I post a video encouragement for our church uh, related to the coronavirus and just encouraging people with hope during a, a tough season. Monday, I kind of, as the day went on, I said, I'm probably just not going to get to that today. I don't feel like there's anything that the Lord is putting on my heart to say. And as the day went on, um, the Lord just kept compressing on me a desire and a, and a burden and a need to say something to do something specifically with regards to racism and uh, the problem that that has become for our country and what the Bible says about it. So uh, as the day went on, um, I began to think, okay, what could that be? And the Lord eventually led me to Psalm 51 and just said, Stephen, the place to start is just confession and lament and uh, putting yourself before God and inviting others to put themselves before God corporately and say, Lord, um, I was born in, in wickedness and in sin, cleanse me and renew a right spirit with me and within me and restore me to, um, to joy. And so uh, as, as Monday went on, I recorded that and then I sent it to Ken and Grant and just said, hey, listen, I'm going to say the name George Floyd. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention racism and I'm going to invite our people to confess. I'd love to make sure you're okay with what I say. And so I waited for their response. Uh, they gave the okay. I posted it late Monday night, about 9.30. Um, Tuesday morning, we woke up uh, and we had a, a planned staff meeting as a church. I came into the staff meeting. After looking at social media that morning, it wasn't a plan for the church to post anything particularly for Blackout Tuesday. Um, but as we began to notice Tuesday morning, uh, the response that on social media that this was getting and looking at some other like-minded churches and Christian organizations and missions agencies that had posted just a black picture. Uh, I brought it before Ken and Grant and said, 
uh, what do you think about doing this? And we had a discussion about it, uh, a lengthy discussion. And the reason we ultimately ended up doing it was I think twofold. Uh, number one is we wanted to express a desire to listen to the black community and to learn, just as Ken said a moment ago, we, we recognize our limits in this and our uh, lack of understanding and our desire to learn and to listen and to be open uh, to better understanding. And the second point uh, was to show solidarity for uh, people who have been oppressed uh, unjustly uh, against biblical principles and against a God who desires mercy and justice and grace and love. And when we saw that those two things were clear, that they were undebatably biblical, um, we decided to do something bold, something that probably we haven't done as a church in the past because we're just becoming more active on social media during this pandemic time. And so while our presence on social media has gone up because of the 10 weeks of uh, shutdown, um, we decided that this would be something bold uh, to post. Uh, and we did the, um, the hashtag Blackout Tuesday, which again is meant to simply say that we're here to listen and to show solidarity. Um, there were other hashtags that were out there that we intentionally chose not to put up, uh, not to, to stir the pot unnecessarily, but simply to pause, to give space for Tuesday to be a day of listening and giving recognition to the fact that we desire God to show justice um, and for us to be part of that as a local church. So uh, anybody else can fill into that more. We can go on with other questions, but that's a general overview. No, I think that's, uh, forgive me if I'm, if I'm repeating anything that you said, but the, the, the whole point of that we understood Blackout Tuesday was to be just that, is to black out social media. So that as you're scrolling through, everything is, is black. There's no advertising. There's no shots of, of uh, your kids or, or whatever else. It's just a, a, a time to pause yeah. and reflect, which is a biblical principle. And that's what we're wanting to do. We talked about um, whether this needs to be brought to the elders or to the council. Um, and we've been doing encouragements from the word of God. Uh, and we don't bring those things before. And we thought that as the, as the pastoral uh, voices of the, of the church, that we, uh, this is something that, we say now, we don't always agree with things that Ken says on Sunday morning, and you don't agree with things that I, I do. That's why we get uh, email interactions after Sunday school. Um, but at the same time, um, that's, so that's why we went ahead and, and did that, because we want you to hear your pastors saying, pause, think about these different things. And it's not a pointing a finger at, at anyone in particular. Um, if that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is the one who uh, convicts, but there's clearly an, an, uh, an act of oppression that happened in Minneapolis with George Floyd. Uh, that was clearly oppressive, um, and there's clearly an oppressed uh, community um, that continues uh, despite all our good intentions, and so we figured it's, it would be good to talk about it by being silent. Just two, two quick additions to that too. Number one is, yeah, in light of just giving space for it, uh, we didn't post a Tuesday encouragement, for instance. So we just had that kind of speak for Tuesday. Uh, and secondly, we acknowledge that social media is an animal. I mean, it's a, it's a wild animal that things that start one way evolve and turn into other things. And, um, and that's, that's part of the nature of it, unfortunately. And so some things, pro some things progress, some things digress on social media. And um, Blackout Tuesday, as the day went on and as the week have gone on, um, you know, there's been some other things that have come out through it that were obviously things that we did not want to intend um, in terms of violent protest and things like that. So we, we simply want to do the things Grant just mentioned uh, and to, to be bold. So, so what do white Christians need to know about what the black community is going through right now? Uh, what are some uh, perceptions or misperceptions that need to be addressed? Black community, meaning the black church or just the black community, period? I would like to, actually, that's a good question. Thanks for clarifying that because it, it's such a broad, um, we can paint with such a broad brush. Um, I would like to hear about the black community because that's what we see. Uh, on the news, and that's what is tend to inform us. And then also, there's the uh, uh, you know the black church as well. Well, I'm not. I, I don't represent 
every black person. I'm not a monolith. We're not broken out of one stone where we all feel the same, think the same. I mean, there are some black people that resent being called black. So, you know, they, they identify as something else. But I think one thing that the, the, the white Christian church should be aware of is that we are just people. Um, there's no question too stupid to ask, you know, there, there's nothing. It's better to ask a question than to, to think you have the answer and you act on those false assumptions. Um, and I think that's why we're still where we were when I was born in 1959. You know, the, the, the country has not improved in terms of race relation. It's the exact same. Just because we had a black president for eight years, we never have improved in how we feel about black people, never. I mean, I think about Al Alexis de Tocqueville. I have to read a quote. Um, he was a, a French diplomat that came to this country in 1831. He wrote a lot about his observations about race in this country in 1831. And he talked about how a black man born into slavery could not sense his own tragedy. That's one quote that has trickled down through the centuries that we are too stupid to know how bad off we have it, that we do not have the brain, um, the, the brain power to even know what is good or bad. I went, I've been accepted in some of the best schools in the country. I was an honor student from kindergarten to senior in high school, but yet I've been accused of just getting into these schools because of quotas. I have never been given the right to just be a smart person. And so we are often treated that we're just stupid, we're, that we're not worth living. So there you have this notion that our lives don't matter. Um, it, it has been, it has never stopped coming out in families, children are fighting it in school, that they're too stupid. Um, black children, children of color have still been getting fed this idea, they're, they're too stupid to excel in life. I mean, I'm even, I'm even stopped by white people who will never let me finish a sentence because they feel they need to help me finish a sentence and to, to because I'm an introvert and I'm an I'm, I'm extreme introvert. So that is a big problem in how white people, white, the white church and the white secular world, the white world of academia sees people of color that we can never make it on our own. We need grants, we need scholarships. And some of us do, some of everybody does because of lack, lack of exposure to things that, that stimulate an intellectual base. So many people who are in poverty need a, a leg up and they should have it because oftentimes the poverty has been caused by um, um, systemic racism that has allowed them not to experience good schools, not to have the best teachers, not to have the best resources. So, uh, so the, the white church should, should realize that black people have a lot against us. We have more against us than for us. And we're very sensitive. We're very fragile about our self-worth. We think we're not good enough. Um, and we, we, we feel like we just want to be given a chance to feel like a human being. And so uh, that's kind of an overall sense of why bla the, the, the mantra Black Lives Matter, which then went to Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, and uh, everything else. That's why it hurts so much to hear that the police were just fired and not uh, charged because there again, the justice system, the world, the United States is telling us, stupid, you deserve to die. You don't deserve to breathe. And I think the best uh, black person in the world is one that just keeps going in spite of everything against them. And uh, 
Yeah, it's scary for white people to have to deal with such damaged goods. It's scary for white people to know what, to, am I, are they gonna get mad if I ask about their lives? Are they gonna, so I understand why you guys are petrified of even having this conversation. We are damaged. Um, so a, a couple a couple thoughts. I just wanna hear uh, you guys respond, uh, Ken and Steven respond to that. But um, you know, my wife was talking about with a, 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 a colleague of hers and uh, she said she, she's black and uh, she, she said that her son every time he goes through the school lunch line he's always asked you know what I'm going to say do you have free and reduced lunch mm -hmm. and, and just, no and the next day free and reduced and so it's that it's mm -hmm. the 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 expectation and it's just things that you might not um, as as a community it's 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 always there. So, um, Stephen, can any any responses, any thoughts? I, I want to ask Lillian again. Uh, so, how do we get beyond that? Um, uh, the uh, the damaged goods uh, of an individual that they feel, and white people have, are feel damaged goods, and you know, so it's not just a black issue. But I I certainly get what you're what you're saying. So how how how, how do we how do we address that? Um, with somebody else that's hurting. Uh, and I know how it goes south, how it goes bad, but uh, what what's needed? What do you, what's needed? Well, get to know more black people from various walks of life um, and, and, and break down, let, let black people break into your circles. Join the NAACP, which is mostly white people in <laughs> in seacoast area but uh you know i think you just have to get to realize whatever it takes to to realize we're just people just like you and we're not all i mean i know sometimes i take um donations to a pantry in exeter and most of the time someone they see me coming they hand, they say what do you need today <laughs> they think I'm there to get food every time, no matter how many times I've been there. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think when we see each other as sisters and brothers, I just I give them a free pass on that because they just don't know that I'm not there. I'm there to drop off food. So uh, I think Ken, to answer your question, I just you just have to allow yourself to get to know more Black people. And uh, if you don't have that, if there are none around, um, read about more black people, read about um, pastors. Uh, I, I know of some book titles, but I didn't bring them. Uh, it's just an, uh, raising your awareness of that we're people, we have families. Um, Cause I don't believe a, an officer would have done that to someone who they felt was human that this person has a family that's going to miss them and their Christmas turkey, they used to cut, you know, who's gonna cut the turkey this year? Because they, they're just people too. Yeah, just to comment, uh, follow up on that, Lillian, you're one of the most gracious people I know. Oh. And you, you would have every reason to just cut somebody to the shreds who asked you, what, what are you doing? What, what do you need today? <laughs> you you give them your pedigree and your educational background and your, I mean, it, you, you just, I'll tell you, Buster, what I, <laughs> and yeah, you, there When I go, oh, brother, <laughs> to myself, to myself. But, yeah. <laughs> well, I know who you are and I know what you've accomplished and I know your degrees and you just are oozing with grace all the time and I oh. appreciate it. Oh, thanks. Yeah, just one comment. It, it maybe maybe it's a, maybe it's a question you can answer too, Lillian. But I think one of the things I've been learning just in the last couple of days, as I've listened to people, is uh, the awkwardness of understanding what churches or Christians should be doing while the world is is on fire, or uh, as our country is is going to the streets. Uh, Christians seem to be in most agreement, ones that read the Bible at least, uh, of the idea that all lives are important mm -hmm. uh, and that black people want to be treated uh, as 
human just as much as white people are or anybody else is, as you've mentioned. Um, but yet there's also this, this either social pressure or maybe it's the Holy Spirit bringing a conviction like he did to me on Monday of we need to do something. We need to say something. We need to write something um, or, or post the right hashtag or whatever. But just it, it's this balance between uh, uh, you know, speaking up for the oppressed and for uh, the black community that has, has received so much injustice through the generations. Yeah. And also um, wanting to just affirm the equality of the humanity of the black community as well. It's that tension place. So I don't know if you have anything uh, to speak into with that of, from a white person, particularly a white Christian, of is, is speaking into it doing the opposite good. Because that was a little bit of the pushback to the Blackout Tuesday was that it, it was actually a distraction from the, uh, the, the, the healthy dialogue. I, Steve, I think if a church makes a decision, if a Christian church where we focus on salvation and being reborn anew, starts to take on some of the social gospel aspect because you really don't want to dump the salvation for the social gospel alone. Um, you're going to lose some people with the social gospel because racism is so entrenched. It, it's, we don't see it as racism anymore. Habits get so entrenched. We don't see that we are racist sometimes. And so it, it's like the church has got to prayerfully make the decision. We're either going to do what's right, because it is scripturally based, and uh, try to explain it to the congregation. But you are going to lose some people, because like that person said, I don't have anything to, to be forgiven about, about this. You know, there's hubris there. There are people there that, resent this idea that this is infiltrating their comfortable lives and there's no way around it it's like you either love jesus or you don't that's the type of savior he is you're either going to do this or you're or, or you're not and um and so that's the tough part about this dialogue in the church and that's why it's so hard yeah, it, it's it's not an easy dialogue to have. If you're going to have it, it's it's not easy to have. No. Um, one thing that was helpful to me was when we were talking on the phone, and it was a great, it was a wonderful conversation. So thank you for that. But um, I think I said something. You know, I think a lot of people are ex are expecting this to go away or their cycles. And you told me, um, see, so that's just the thing. This never goes away. Uh, if you are a person of color. Um, you can't wait until the next thing because it's something that you deal with every, every day. Yeah. Um, the, one of the things that I've learned as, and as I've processed these things, uh, the idea of privilege is very, um, uh, it, it, it can be offensive because we're New Englanders. We work hard and we, we work hard for what we have. And that's absolutely true. Um, at the same time, in the neighborhood that I lived in, uh, I was, you know, I was thankful for the police presence that was there. I was because it was a, um, it was a poor, low income area. And so there was crime and there was shootings and different things that happened. So I was thankful for the police presence, but I never was afraid of the police. I felt like I could go up to a police officer and a police officer would, could come up to me. And there was never in my mind, was there ever a thought that um, I needed to alter my behavior in any way. And that's just a small, that's just a small um, form of privilege. I just have to realize that's not a racist thing. It, it's, it is what it is. It's, um, uh, it, it's not an attitude or anything that there's, there is a, there is a system that's there that, that, that offers that. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, it's like what you said that you, it doesn't go away. Um, this isn't something that you can not think about. And so another one of the things is that a lot of times for if you're not dealing with it on a daily basis, it just doesn't come up. Yeah. Um, 
And that's a privilege. And that's one of the things that I've been thinking about through the last week or so is that it's a privilege to not have to think about race. And a lot of us want it to just, let's just, why are we talking about this again? And yeah. or why are we, why is this happening? I don't know if that's, um, that's the impression that I get. And, and I've, I, I've heard those sorts of things. Why is this such a big deal? It's from the past and I'm not racist. And well, because we don't have to think about it, but our, our, our um, black brothers and sisters and people of color who are brothers and sisters in Christ are thinking about it every day. And so there's, there's that empathy and that compassion that we want to express. And I'm not saying that well, but I'm, <laughs> I want to um, be able to you know, push into that. And um, even if I don't say it well, but you said it well. Not everything has to be said well. It just needs to be said. It doesn't all have to be said well. They don't have to march well. They just need to march. That, that's the thing. You, we just have to do what we can do, the best that we can do it. You're on mute. There you go. <laughs> um, just as, as we close, there's a it's important uh, to speak whenever you can be heard though just to build up for that <laughs> isn't it wouldn't it be nice if you could just mute me whenever you wanted um the uh um in closing one one thought i had is that um the gospel the gospel makes a difference we believe that the gospel makes a difference yes. uh in, in this and in every in 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 all situations wherever there is a uh, sin and fractured. And so how do we as a church approach this differently than say, um, getting caught up in, um, you know, the zeitgeist, uh, how is the Christian response different, uh, say, and this is open to, 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 to all of us. Um, you know, how, how do you guys see this as what is the Christian response, the gospel response? Well, this being Pentecost week, it, it, it strikes me as, is wonderful that we have been given the power to do this very hard thing. The Holy Spirit has, has, is living within us, those who follow Jesus, who accepted Jesus. He gave Peter a voice that Peter didn't have before to say, to witness for Jesus, risking his own life. We have been given a voice to risk our lives and our churches to speak truth to power. And I, I do want to answer uh, what Ken was talking about earlier, things that demean um, black people that white people aren't aware of, um, saying we all look alike, or, oh, aren't you Sister Smith? Oh, you look just like her, or do you sing? That was a big thing when I was growing up. Every black person, I was going to a white Pentecostal church when I was a kid. I went to many churches, but, uh, the man would always ask, do you sing, brother? Come right up here and do us a song. Not every Black person sings. <laughs> also, the fact that uh, probably the biggest thing that's demeaning is to always feel like you're racist. If a Black person is, you're always threatened racist, and there's this defense that goes up. And, and, and if you have to question that's not, if you have to say that's not racist, it's racist, you know, it's just, it just, it, it, we're, you know, we're, we're, we live in a racist society. So there's a huge probability that what you're thinking is not racist is racist. And so just accept it and then start talking about it. Ask someone, ask your white brothers and sisters, you know, talk to the black people that you know, just be vulnerable to being wrong. Um, you know, I, white people always seem like they have to be right, particularly white ministers, educated ministers. There's this notion, I'm going to study this and I'm going to get it right. And then you get, you get resentful if, 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 if somebody suggests you're wrong. We've got to put that away. We've got to be humble like the Christ who was born in a pig trough. We've got to remember Christ's humble origins and kind of get clothed in humility again because there's an arrogance um, in white privilege that, that just suggests that you guys have all the answers and you, know, you just don't and, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, just uh, the thing that comes to mind when you talk about gospel and how does it affect all this is uh, uh, having been reconciled to God, go and be reconcilers one to the other. And uh, this, this is, this is going to take work, uh, but let's not give up on it. Let's be reconciled one to the other. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. One of the passages, yeah, one, one of the passages uh, throughout uh, the time of the coronavirus and the quarantine and shutdown that's been repeatedly coming back up in my life is 1 Peter 4.19, which is Peter's talking about the context of suffering. And again, talk about a, a selfish white person who for the last nine, 10 weeks has just been, oh, this is so difficult. I'm, I'm all by myself. I have my kids at home. I'm dealing with all these uh, luxuries that have been taken away. And then bam, something happens in the world that uh, God uses at least to convict me to show me uh, suffering is, is a moving target uh, for different people, uh, different parts of the world, different uh, races. And so uh, when Peter's talking about the context of suffering in first Peter four, he gets to verse 19 and he says, while suffering, entrust your soul to a faithful creator. And then these three words change me while doing good. And, and for me, uh, that that's been carrying me through this season. And then now with this week uh, with George Floyd, it's been, okay, what does that mean while I'm giving my soul over to God and entrusting myself, trusting that he's faithful and that he's carrying things from a beginning point to an end point in a story of redemption and Jesus has made a way for all his people, what does it mean for me to do good even while in this continual process of entrusting my soul to a faithful creator? And so um, that, that's been the question that's been on my heart this week of with this particular scenario. What does it look like for a white young pastor, a white young parent to uh, teach, disciple, um, say, speak, uh, listen uh, in a time of racial tension and when um, brothers and sisters are being unjustly treated. Yeah, and uh, Lillian, you uh, gave me, a, you pointed me to a uh, video cast um, mm -hmm. from uh, Elevation Church. It was, it was a great, a great video cast. And one of the key parts of that was a uh, interaction between uh, the white pastor and the black pastor, and um, he was saying, you're, you're not, you don't want white people to go around feeling guilty. It seems like we're, there's always going around, there's this white guilt, and uh, just going around and beating ourselves up, and and uh, frankly, a lot of times, white people feel judged, right? So, there, we, we don't want to, we don't want to judge people, um, and, and but also, we don't want to put guilt on us, but that's the, that's the beauty of the gospel, is that Christ has taken our guilt, uh, and so in turning to him, he's not asking us to bear our guilt. And I think that's, a, I think that's one of the uh, secular responses is reacting out and acting out of guilt. It's a guilt motivation. So, okay, this has been done and there's an injustice that's been done. And so um, I need to make amends. I can't make amends. What's the gospel tell us to do? It, it, it calls us to repent. And I think that is what, so my pastor's heart is uh, is that we have a call to repentance and i can't i can't call anyone to repent i can't make i can't look at somebody in the eye and say you know you, you can in a prophetic way but it's the holy spirit that's going to bring about the conviction that brings about repentance and that's the change that happens and you had this week so far in the encouragements an example from two pastors um who you know, reading Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, oh God. What, what, is, what are you asking me to do? This is a good pastor whose, whose response is to repent. And then uh, Pastor Ken just saying, look, I'm sorry. In his encouragement uh, yesterday, he, he was repenting. And so I think I, I, I do want to encourage the people uh, in our church. I know this is a, a touchy subject, and I know it can raise a lot of um, ire, but we're willing to push into that if it means uh, that we open up, um, open ourselves up to the accusation of the Holy Spirit, and we would repent of of wrongdoing. And so that's really what a, a lot of this is about. And I think that's what the gospel has to say, and and why the the secular world will not get it until we until we uh, try to put away and and uh, put away our own guilt, 
and be righteous in and of ourselves by our own actions and repent of the sin and call it that and turn and, and then be and empowered by the Holy Spirit, be reconciled to one another. But yet, I think that there's something you mentioned. There's a discomfort with the feeling of, of being judged. There's a discomfort of, with the guilt. But this is hard work. Second Chronicles 714 talks about humbling ourselves. We've got to sit in the judging and the guilt to get through this. You can't skip, skip through the guilt quickly because black people are judged all the time because they're you know, judged as less than, judged as guilty, judged as you stole something, judged as you didn't get there without our help. But yet you wanna skip right through the judgment and the guilt. You know, we can't, we have to sit in the guilt to really move ahead. That's just like someone trying to heal in a dysfunctional family at a counselor, at a counseling session that does not want to share all the bad things about themselves. You gotta get, you gotta face the bad before we can get to healing about this. And that is why it may not happen. It may not happen because it's not worth it to a lot of people to sit in the guilt or for, for, to help a black person feel, feel equal in society. It's just not worth it. And you know, Jesus told them to go wait in a room and do something irrelevant to their lives. They could have lived a full life without going into that upper room, those disciples. But they did it out of obedience and humility. We've got to do it whether it's relevant to us or not, or we, or this is just going to be a nice Zoom talk, really. Amen. You can't, you can't yeah. tiptoe through the tulips to get beyond the guilt. We love the tulips, but we got to get through the stink. We got to sit in the stink and dialogue. And many people do not see the relevance to their lives. Look at what happened in the upper room because some people were obedient. Whether they saw the relevance or not, they were obedient to the Lord. So uh, I, I, that, this is something only prayer is going to tell us how to do it. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's where the gospel, that's where uh, I think we as pastors have um, a message, a message to give. And so you're talking, you're talking about confessing. We need to confess and uh, confess, acknowledge our guilt, um, ask the Holy Spirit to show us our guilt, and um, and, and and repent and, and be changed. So, um, yeah. Well, we're. Um, I think we've gone over our intended time. <laughs> this actually probably. Um, I I know that this probably raises more questions for people then it does answers. And that's not a bad thing. And this is not a um, particularly uh, comforting uh, uh, comforting thing where we, we, we feel nice and, you know, uh, warm, fuzzy. This is, a, this is uncomfortable, and we understand that. There's been a lot of uh, discomfort and awkwardness that we've pushed into um, through coronavirus, and, and the Lord has brought this our way uh, in our discussion, and we want to embrace that. And so, this is a beginning. This isn't a, uh, this isn't, okay, we've checked the box, um, but this is kind of a, this is a beginning. So Ken, I'm going to um, give you the pa the last word, if you would <laughs> surprise you with the last word, if you want to just close us in prayer, or if you have any uh, final thoughts, um, certainly want to thank Lillian. Um, I know you're, you're, you're a busy woman and uh, uh, yeah, thank you for coming and sharing with us and and being willing to uh, walk us through that. And I just want your congregation to know I love you all. <laughs> we'll get through this. I, I was born in Maine, raised in, born and raised in Kittery. Don't let me scare you. <laughs> love you. Uh, there's, there's so much I'd like to ask you, Lillian. Just to there is. All of us. Yeah, but um, I, I mean, I, I yeah. I, I, my, my closing prayer, I guess, would just be a blessing. Um, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to 